last year, I have a very dear friend in Warsaw called Mr. Lewandowski, and he called me to come and visit Oronsko. And I said, but why? Where is it? And he said, well, there's a great Anish Kapoor exhibition. I said, oh, I'm interested. And then he told me all about this very interesting sculpture center. And we came over, we saw the exhibition, and I, then I met with the director. And there was a discussion of a possibility of having the exhibition in the museum where Anish Kapoor was at the time. But when I saw the palace, I asked the director, who's an artist himself, I said, but wouldn't it be possible for me to exhibit in the palace? Because I think my art would come alive and so would the building. It would be a nice combination. And he thought about it a little bit and he said, oh yes, it's a very good idea. So here we are, the exhibition will be opening tomorrow. And uh, I took lots of photographs of the place, took them home, and I was looking at them, seeing uh, the works of the artists who lived in this place and the pictures of the original owners. And it connected a little bit to my art because these works are about memories. And in short, I call them memory of love, memories of love. And so it really became a really nice combination, the two different memories together. Because this building is uh, a memorial memory to the past. And so are my sculptures. My sculptures are a memory of a childhood or a childhood that did not exist, an imaginary childhood. So even though when you come in to see an exhibition like this or mine, at first glance they're very simple, very visual, but in fact I planned this room to the maximum. We have the three Stalins, which are becoming Pinocchio, which is the symbol of a lie. We also have the two Mickeys with the magic wand. And in my mind, because I grew up during Stalinist period in Hungary, I wish Mickey was there with the magic wand made and with the magic wand, he could have made Stalin and Stalinism disappear. So I have them here to use their magic wands against the three Stalins. And on the wall above me is something that remained from before and it will remain long after this brutal period, which is Christianity. And so it's a nice little story which completes Polish and Hungarian history in a very different way. The first time and the reason I made the three Stalins turning into Pinocchio because I was asked to do an exhibition at Fondazione Mutimba in Italy about 10 years ago and the idea was to have a dialogue with Italian culture. So to me the three most important, four most important things in Italian culture are Renaissance art, the Communist Party, which is even today the second most important party in Italy, Christianity, which never went away, and football. So the entire exhibition on three floors were having a dialogue with Italy through these three subjects, but because for me their idea of communism is kind of idealistic or not realistic, I decided to turn Stalin into Pinocchio as a symbol, how silly they are about this idea, from our point of view anyway. And, but of course they have the right to feel how they want and since they never experienced it it's very easy to idolize something that we would like to have but we never had it and that's why I made them and I made them out of bronze and I painted them to make them very impressive and actually I think this was the first time I worked with bronze and now they're traveling unfortunately because they're relevant in every culture I was walking through and I suddenly remembered what a long journey this has been. I never had a sculpture exhibition. I always had exhibitions of paintings. I'm a painter. And here is the first time where I have no paintings, only sculptures. And it made me remember how this journey started. I had an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tel Aviv and the curator, Arthur Schwartz, was walking with me while discussing at the exhibition on the street in Italy. And there was a, a, a sale of objects that they're selling on the street. 
and I saw two Disney figures, and I said, well, these are very interesting. So maybe it's a way. And he went, he came back, he says, I bought them both, it's a present for me, but you should turn them into your works, and you will ex exhibit them at the museum in Tel Aviv. And that's how the whole process started. I started to make these objects, and I fell in love with them. But then, when he wrote his essay, he analyzed me, and he said that I'm making these sculptures because I'm trying to relive a non-existing childhood or create a childhood that I never had. And here I am now in this beautiful palace surrounded with my toys. So the exhibition I had that time in Italy, in Milano, I, I forgot one of the things I did was fiat, which was of course the post-war culture icon for Italy. And for us Hungarian, when I was a child, that was the ultimate luxury car, a little Fiat. And I found an original Fiat in Italy and I covered it in lace and had it painted and that was exhibited. And then I made a small model which was then cast in bronze. And the little anecdote about that story, I bought it over the internet and they told me it was totally restored. I had to go to Naples to pick up the car. When I arrived, it was a broken down rotten Fiat but it was already paid for, so I had no choice. And, but they gave me the, the ownership card that comes with the car, and inside it was a Hungarian owner from Budapest as the first owner of the car. So for me it was worth it, we took it back to Hungary, and of course because Hungarian national colors are red, white, and green, Italians are green, white, and red, so just how you turn the colors, they either Hungarian or Italian. And so I used the colors on the original Fiat. So in Hungary, it was Hungarian, Italy, it was Italian, it was very convenient. And then Pinocchio, of course, I had to have because it's the ultimate Italian story, but only because of Walt Disney. The original story is really more for grown-ups. And it's a story about unconditional love, not about love. And Walt Disney turned it into a children's fairy tale. Actually, even then, it's a little bit strong. And in that, the line becomes the dominant feature of the story. So it was very good to show it in Italy and have a conversation about it, how stories, how reality changes history, or how history changes reality, how we got to see it. And the third piece in this room, which connects to Italy, after Pope Francis visited Milano, there were more than a million people at his service. And afterwards, they wanted to commemorate the place where his student held his prayers. And uh, I entered the competition, I won the competition, I created a monument which is in the park where he stood. And then the Pope asked for a small version for his personal use in his office or his library, I don't know where it is. And so I made an addition of six of them all with all different lace. And one of those are exhibit, is exhibited here. So uh, the one thing here is not obvious because we are showing sculptures. The reason Betty Boop is in this room, because this was the master bedroom for the lady of the house. So I present her as the lady, the occupant of this room. But we are in this house where we are actually facing something from the past where the lady of the house is one end of the house, the man of the house at the other end of the house in his bedroom. And how over the past hundred years, evolution in our societies changed the way we live. And how ladies are now in the same position or should be in the same position as men are. And that reminded me when we do this and we're talking, I was, I was telling a very short story about my grandmother. I was maybe eight or nine years old. We were three brothers, I'm the youngest. And we were having lunch with my grandfather in the kitchen at the table. Four of us, four men at the table eating. And my grandma was sitting next to the cooking stove on a little food stove, eating her soup from her lap because she should not sit at the table with a man. I was eight years old, what kind of man am I? But in her mind, this was the proper way to behave. And I am very grateful that we don't have to do this anymore. And May West, actually, that Betty Boop is based on, she was a very strong lady, kind of a proto-feminist in her time in Hollywood. 
she would not take no for an answer from a man. And there are very famous stories about her. So she belongs here. So this actually connects a little bit my life. I was born in England, my parents were Hungarian, but they moved back to Hungary in 56 before the revolution. So I grew up in Hungary, and but technically I was English because I was born in England. And I always dreamt of leaving Hungary and going to England, and the Beatles movie Hard Taste Nice arrived. I went to see it eight or ten times, and that's when I decided I must go. So I, I managed to escape from Hungary. I end up in London, and my first job was being a living butler for a French general. So when I created this sculpture, this was my first self-portrait. After making the first one sculpture, Stalin, I started to think about making more of them, but for me it was important to make unique works. So even though I made for the Italian show eight Bugs Bunnies, each are cast from wax, and if the audience would look at it closely, each wax was covered with lace, but each object is a different lace, different patterns, so actually each rabbit is totally different when you look at it. The details are totally, totally, totally different, and then I painted them, of course. But one of the reasons I decided to paint bronze is because the whole idea of Renaissance was based on Greek sculptures, ancient Greek sculptures that we, the Romans discovered, but they were already just plain white marble. But then we realized later that they were totally painted, dressed, made very fancy, and actually quite ugly by our standards. But even though we realized that those sculptures would be thought they were perfect, which Renaissance is based on and actually the next three centuries, we still decided that even though they were just remnants, not the finished sculptures, that that is perfection, that's the finished product. So I decided to paint the bronze, to make the bronze disappear, to make it look like something different than what it is. So making the reverse, making them look like how the Greek sculptures would have looked like at the time when they were made. And that's why they are so fancy, colorful bronze. On some of the sculptures, I reverse the process. First, I paint the sculptures through the dots and then apply the lace. So the lace is highly visible to show the different materials I use on the sculptures. But the reason for this is because originally on my paintings, I used lace for a very important reason. Women over the centuries created lace artworks, which were kind of, even I as a child, considered a bit ridiculous being on the top of a TV or back of a chair. But these were made with love, a kind of creative need from women after they've done all the day's work, and they still have a desire to express themselves somehow. So after I had a relationship with a lady who enlightened me about feminism, and I came to realize how wrong I was in me with many of my ideas as an old-fashioned Hungarian man, I started to look at lace in a different, in a different light. So when I started to make my paintings and I wrote stories about relationships, love, etc., I decided to cover those stories with lace. And when the viewer come to see the exhibition, I would confront them with something that they disregarded as something that had no value. And this way I tried to create works where those ladies' works helped me create a beautiful artwork. 